Pasito tum tum, pasito tum tum, pasito tum tum, pasito tum tum. Hello, this is Chef Willy. Welcome to a classic modern reviews. 2001, A Space Odyssey, Interstellar. What do they have in common? It's a story in space. Let's talk about sci-fi. People have a misunderstood notion that science fiction is all about the aliens, robots, spaceships, guns shooting laser beams. And while it's not far from the truth, science fiction stories have always been told from ancient times as myths. They were mostly about journeys that had some supernatural or fantastic element to it, from ancient and medieval stories to more modern and progressive ones. In 1902, a short French film called A Trip to the Moon evolved the science fiction genre from exploring our home planet to other places in space. Now we were no longer facing off against giant octopuses, we were facing off against aliens. We were no longer fighting our enemies with swords, we were fighting them with blasters. They would become an escapism around the 20s and 40s from the hardships of poverty and the wars. Most often were just viewed as fantasy or at best, kid stuff. Until we get into the good old 50s. The US enters into the space race, nuclear bombs are being blasted, which got into the people's attention related to science and space. Now science fiction had to be more profound and meaningful about the times that we lived in. That is until Stanley Kubrick came along in 1968 for 2001 A Space Odyssey, a genre he didn't particularly care so much, but damn it even at his worst, he gave it his best. Considered to be the crowning achievement of science fiction, it demonstrated how this genre could be more than just fantasy. It could be deep, it could be worthy of discussion, it could interpret where our place in the world would be in years to come. Its influence has still lived through the test of time, whether you noticed it when you were a kid or not, and it allowed other science fiction movies to become classics of their own. In fact, Christopher Nolan has stated that Interstellar was inspired by Kubrick's own space odyssey on how to make space, the effects, and the story have as much depth as Kubrick's did. These are the two that are mostly compared for their similar approach of taking you from your seat to an experience of high surreal levels. However, both share mixed reactions on their releases. Nobody could make up what 2001 was about, which left many pretty bored. Interstellar is considered by some to be the weakest of Nolan's projects, but even if this is their worst, at their standards, they're still great for how much meat and topic there is to chew on and talk about. It all depends on what are you looking for. Are you looking for something more challenging that takes you out of your comfort zone, or are you looking for something simple but still complicated to follow? So. I'll be looking into three, yet four themes that these films have in common, yet are very different, starting with one of those being the experience. Both films had amazing effects that made you feel you were there in space. Kubrick's effects were way ahead of its time that still hold up to this date. The use of practical miniatures, rotating sets. Christopher Nolan is also credited for not using CGI as often as we believe. Everything was shot on location or in a set with the use of practical effects, accompanied by that thunderous musical sound. But I had a different experience when I saw both films. While Interstellar felt as if I was there in space, 2001 felt as if I was experiencing a play in space. I always saw the pen floating as if it were dancing to the orchestra. Same with the ships, always floating and twirling like ballerinas to the rhythm of the music. Now, the benefit of Nolan's films is he knows how to make them look big and epic. Interstellar is no different, but I felt there were times where I couldn't appreciate the quietness of space since they would cut back to the other characters for expedition. With Kubrick, he hypnotizes you to appreciate the look of space, the look of the ships, the look of the unknown worlds, sometimes lasting from 5 minutes to 20 without dialogue. He gives it to you with no interruptions, and it's easily one of my favorite parts of the movie. 
Now, it can be too long and make you lose your patience, but it complements what the characters experience as well as the audience. The ending is where it gets more mind-boggling, taking you to another realm where the main actors fall into. Suddenly, the atmosphere changes completely to the mesmerizing look and beauty of what lies in the unknown, but also feeling as if you were trapped with them, suffocating in the deepest, darkest, lonely parts of space. 2001 and Interstellar are the main examples that belong in the big screen to witness the wonder and awe of what going into the cinema is all about. Now let's see what these directors predict is in store for us in years to come. The one thing these two films have in common the most is they're excited for the future. They're excited to know how far are we going to take technology and how far are we going to take exploration into space as it is the strongest theme in both films. 2001 is about exploring the moon and Jupiter to find a mysterious monolith that has been discovered which could change the history of humanity. Interstellar is about leaving the Earth to find a new habitable planet through a black hole since our world is no longer habitable. The food doesn't grow as it used to and the Earth is no longer as breedable as before. While both focus on voyaging in space, they have their own separate concerns about where is humanity going to end up. 2001 is more concerned about the evolution of humanity with technology. Interstellar is more concerned whether humanity will survive habiting another planet. These are relatable concerns that are not as fictional as some I think. So let's start by looking into Interstellar's concerns. In the film, there is a poem that keeps getting recited and it's a key to know what is the tone of the mission. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Do not go gentle into that good night. Do not go gentle into that good night. Do not go gentle into that good night. Do not go gentle. This poem was written by Dylan Thomas in 1951. It's about his lamentation toward his dying father, who in his dead bed encourages him to keep fighting for his life. So what this poem represents is the inevitable fate of the Earth in the movie and in real life. Our planet is dying. The exposure of climate change has led many into paranoia lately. Mass hysteria has been on the horizon because of seawater levels rising up. Hurricanes are much stronger than ever. People of faith call it the end of times. Scientists call it global warming. Whatever you want to call it, the point of these climate problems is it can't be stopped. By this point, it's beyond fixing. The movie doesn't tell that it's global warming, but you can tell that's exactly what it is. So the only way to fight back for our survival is to find another planet that sustains us. Similar to how in real life, that's what they're doing. Take Mars for example. It is the one planet astronauts are focused on reaching. Around the year 2022, scientists such as Elon Musk and SpaceX are preparing to send people up there on Mars. What's the goal? Colonize it and overpopulate it. This would be like the Noah story. Instead of animals, we would be taking humans to procreate on Mars. But even though it does sound interesting for me, I also wonder, will it last in the long run? I mean, because our bodies were not made to move from one planet to the other. So we would be depending solely on technology to keep a colony, if not a whole city alive, especially in a planet where there's no food or oxygen. One mistake in those engineerings and you've lost your whole city. But I can see the right wing getting on board with it. I mean, it would be their only excuse to abolish gay movements because you know, Mars, you cannot procreate. Now the way Interstellar expresses this theme is only through fiction of black holes that some might find offense for its inaccuracy. Even though there are theories about wormholes that can take you into a shortcut, no one really knows. Because no one knows what's down there. If you go inside a black hole, you die. Your body will expand like a spaghetti, instantly tearing you apart to the point you fade into nothingness. But it doesn't necessarily need to be taken literally. It's a reflection of today's excitement and worry of a dying planet and the only solution that it brings up is to abandon it. No compromise and the idea itself can be downbeating and scary at times. But just like that good old poem says... Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against...
witness the dying of the light. Now let's take a look into the evolution of man and technology, how it's excited to predict many things, the rise of iPads, talking to each other on Skype. The only thing they mispredicted was by the year 2001, we've already colonized the moon. <laughs> Embarrassing. I also find it interesting that control over technology can be a main theme in this story. It can be used for pure reasons at times, but oftentimes can be used to feed in our egos. Take artificial intelligence, for example. In our nature for control, will we end up creating psychotic robots that turn against us and probably replace us? It seems so. It is something consequential to ask because artificial intelligence is not far from taking place. It's happening now. I would even consider Sophia as the first AI celebrity I heard of so far. Hi, Sophia. Hello, Jimmy. Oh, my God. <laughs> Do you know where you are? Of course. I'm in New York City, and I'm on my favorite show, The Tonight Show. What emotion do you feel being awake and alive? Curious. Are you curious to be alive? Do you want to destroy humans? Please say no. Okay, I will destroy humans. <laughs> no, I take it back. <laughs> Early this year, Facebook made a robot that was supposed to learn how to negotiate like a human, but was later shut down that same year because of creating a new language that nobody could understand, except the other robots it was talking to. They might say it wasn't out of fear, but still, how creepy it is a billion dollar company kills off its investment for showing intelligence of its own they didn't even know it had. But I also wonder, how much of this promoted fear of killer robots is done on purpose? And in that intimidation, the AI characters only serve one purpose, either be servants or out of control. In Interstellar, Tars has a minor role, he brings humor to the crew, but only because he's programmed to have a limited sense of humor. Humor. 75%. Confirmed. Auto self-destruct, T minus 10, 9. Let's make that 60%. 60% confirmed. In 2001 A Space Odyssey, HAL 9000 has a major role. He's a super advanced computer that goes killing everyone aboard because he hears a conversation about his human masters plotting to disconnect him. Open the pod bay doors, HAL. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. HAL is one of those great villains because of what he represents. He was created with the capacity to feel and reason as a human until his creators threaten his life, which he strikes back out of the fence. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me, and I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. He's a great villain because his actions turn back at us as the bad people. We made him this way, we made him have instincts of emotions, reason, and even survival instincts. I'm afraid. I'm afraid, Dave. It goes back once again about control. Sometimes control over other lives is the greatest evil in the world. If they go beyond the limits they were programmed, they'll be terminated. It can only be attributable to human error. This sort of thing has cropped up before, and it has always been due to human error. It's reverse psychology as to who in reality is the monster in the story. Is it Hal, or is it us who made him this way? For that, it makes not only one hell of a scary villain, but it makes one hell of a scary future if that's where we want to reach with technology. But what happens when you move from science to the unknown mysteries of the universe, when your film gets a little bit too deep? Movies are often influenced by the director's views on politics or religion. Kubrick would often express his beliefs in the movies once in a while. Nolan, however, tries to keep it minimal and not let it interfere with the story. Both films can be viewed as religious experiences for the search of the unknown, 2001 being the monolith 
and Interstellar being they. Both of these mysterious beings try to help humanity to survive and each one I found to have a different meaning of what they represent. The monolith represents our logic and knowledge and they represent our emotions. But for now, let's focus on the monolith. What is it? Where does it come from? What is its purpose? It only shows up three times in the movie, one with the apes, later with the scientists who discover it, and finally a bowman's deadbed. All we know is whatever species it encounters, they evolve into something much revolutionary. It evolved the monkeys into men, and men into whatever is coming after us. The answers are left vague and unexplained so we can come up with our own conclusions, and that's the beauty of it. The black 3D rectangle with no image permits us to add whatever image or color we want it to mean. Some believe that it represents aliens, others believe that it represents God, and either answer could be right. Even though Kubrick was an atheist himself, he was more oriented to the idea of aliens. In fact, his whole movie is about showing that there might be intelligent life form out there somewhere. Scientists know now that there are about a hundred billion stars in our galaxy and about a hundred billion galaxies in the visible universe. There are so many stars in the universe that the likelihood of life evolving around them, even if it were possibilities of one in a million, there would be hundreds of millions of worlds in the universe. Now on my perspective of why I think this monolith represents knowledge, that's because whatever comes out of the sky with some knowledgeable intelligence, divine or an alien, we're gonna consider it as a god. This monolith enlightens the characters to become something they thought they could never be. It made the monkeys from dumb witty creatures to know how to use bones as a tool and a weapon. Followed by the famous transition of the bone in the sky, evolving into a floating machine in space. It's a significant transition because this knowledge embodies who we are as humans, inventors and annihilators of life. We learn how to use tools to build, but we learn how to take away a life with it. Machines can build, but they can also destroy. It's an unknown knowledge that helps us grow, but it can fight back to remain its identity unknown. It's a knowledge that can be present in our minds during our last hours asking, where is this going to take us? Will it take us to God? To aliens? To the ground? And the more ambiguous the answer is, the more fascinating is the mystery it creates. Then we move on to Interstellar. In the movie, gravity or also known as they, are approached as these five dimensional beings that can cross over our three dimensional universe. It can interfere with our past, with our future. At times it may sound as if it were something spiritual. It's not bound by our dimensions and time, but it can make contact with us. But who are they? They chose you. They. <laughs> it's that Who's they? I thought they chose me. You might interpret them as ghosts or God or intelligent life form trying to make contact with us, but Nolan gave us the answers of who they are. It's us, the human race. I brought myself here. We're here to communicate with a three-dimensional world. We're the bridge. What Kubrick and Nolan's endings have in common is they end with the hope that humanity might have a place in the future. Interstellar hopes that humanity will live long enough to evolve into a super advanced human race to which boundaries no longer limit our ambition to create. In a way, it would place us as gods of our own, so capable of even creating five dimensional universes ourselves. Even more capable of crossing timelines from past and future. That's too much ambition. Still, it is fascinating if that's what Nolan had in mind. But since they represent emotions, they're motivated by the same spell out words. I'm gonna find a way to tell Murph, just like I found this moment. How, Cooper? We love Tars, love. It's just like Grant said. My connection with Murph, it is quantifiable. Which leads me to part of and final themes of these stories. If there's one reaction I often hear to be cringe-worthy in Interstellar, that would be Anne Hathaway lecturing us about love. Love isn't something we invented, it's observable, powerful. It has to mean something. Even though for some this came out being over-sentimentally cheesy, 
I actually found it interesting to bring emotions together with science. It is often labeled as a battle of logic and emotions, but Nolan tries to present a future where logic and emotions can work and coexist together. A future where it is not only ruled by facts and knowledge, but by the basic instincts that make us human. What we try to do is balance emotional clarity with the challenging nature of the geometry of, of the sequence. And for me, refining the sequence is all about the emotional side. Our emotion sets us in a goal we're interested to succeed, and our logic makes us think of how to make it work. In this case, these four characters work through the same goal of saving the world using these two elements differently from each other. Matthew McConaughey is a balance of logic and emotions. He's afraid his daughter will grow up resenting him for leaving them, and it's his emotional attachment towards her that motivates him to save the world. Matt Damon acts solely on logic. He knows the Earth is going to die, so there's no point to save it other than start over somewhere else. Anne Hathaway is conflicted to follow her logic or emotions, proven when the crew decides to go on Matt Damon's planet when she wanted to go to her boyfriend's planet. Michael Caine can be the tragic side that once followed his emotions of saving the world until he lost all hope on it. Emotions can impulse us to survive in times of trouble, the fear that anyone can relate to, the fear of failure, the fear of losing a loved one, fear to leave home, fear to explore a new life only to realize it was not worth it. While in 2001, feelings are dead. The characters don't express much emotion or personality. In fact, they're not even well developed. There's a subplot where this doctor misses time with his family, but then they go nowhere with his arc. Halfway through, he disappears. Where? We don't know. We never see him again. Did he go back to his family? Did he stay for the mission? We don't know. But it was Kubrick's intention to make the characters blander. It was to show how humans will become much colder as they get smarter, while robots learn how to express emotions more than us. Watching this again, it could have been brought up a little better. Instead of being a scientific theory of how Anne Hathaway has a crush for her dead boyfriend, but it has pure intentions of not only saving humanity, but what little is left of our humanity. Together, these elements makes us whole and complete. We're not complete if we have emotions, but no logic. Neither are we complete if we have logic, but no emotions. Now, for those of you who found Interstellar to be overrated, this might be sort of a stretch to say, but here's a picture I want to make. 2001 was way ahead of its time and had a lukewarm response. Now it's a classic. Could it be that maybe Interstellar, it's already a classic and we just don't know it yet? Just like 2001 got better through the years for displaying an accurate future, could it be possible that maybe this came out way ahead of its time? Could it be that Interstellar displaces a real future where one day our only concern will be on survival? Only time will answer that. Now not to say that they're free from having problems. Interstellar can turn into a long lecture of black holes, gravity, dimension, time that might leave you confused if you're not following up. The characters can be irresponsible at times or be rubbed the wrong way by Matt Damon's cameo, which now that I think about it, this could be a prequel to this. 2001, even though it holds up the best, it's like if you were watching, well, Fantasia. It looks great, but it is a challenge to get through its ungodly slow pace. In fact, I remember the first time I saw it. I had to take a break from it and finish it the following day. It's one of those you don't remember exactly what is it about, but you remember its visual art, special effects, and thought provoked question of our place in the universe. But I don't see each one as a downgrade from the other. I see the two of them as the opposite side of a coin, jointed together, putting our logic and emotions as one whole that tells what we're made of and what we could become, what holds ahead of our nature and what makes us human, our yearn to create, to destroy, to explore, to express pain and emotion, to control, to seek knowledge, our crave for the unknown, and our excitement for the future. And those were my thoughts on 2001 and Interstellar. If you like this video, leave a like and subscribe to this channel for more content. And I also like to hear your thoughts on it. Did you like these films? Did you not like them? Do you have another interpretation of what they mean? Was it boring? Was it a bit confusing at times? 
Well, guys, tune in next time because even though by this point it's kind of late to do it, but I said I was going to do it, so I'm going to do it. I'll be finishing part two of the summer movies of 2017. So for now, that's it for today. <gasps> Ciao. Pasito tu, pasito tu.